me. Um, welcome to uh, the webinar uh, that E3G is hosting with an esteemed uh, group of people to talk about the integration of climate risks into um, financial regulations, particularly with a view to the United States market. Um, we have um, an hour and a half. Uh, I should introduce myself first. I'm Claire Healy, I work um, with E3G based in Washington, DC. E3G is a, uh, I like to say, a small but feisty organization where we're working to, towards a climate safe world. And we employ a whole of economy approach, traditional diplomacy, but also looking to use all the levers at our disposal, trade, social policies, and increasingly financial regulation. So we're hugely excited to see how this agenda has evolved and central bank policymakers and financial regulators and supervisors taking the uh, climate risks seriously and working studiously to integrate them into, the, into their tools and their approaches. Um, so we're going to have a conversation about that and what that looks like in the United States context. Um, we're going to roughly uh, look, spend some time looking at you know, level setting and looking at how this conversation has evolved and looking ahead to the next year where we expect to see, I think, a more assertive United States sort of in, uh, on, on this agenda item. And for that, we're going to turn to Bob Litterman to sort of start us off. Then we'll be looking at the context in which we find ourselves with cover, COVID recovery and um, these powerful institutions using their operations to help the economy recover from COVID. And so how we merge that with the uh, integration of climate risk. And for that, we have with us uh, um, El Simon and Nick from the London School of Economics, who've worked, pulled together a toolbox, which they will be talking to us about. And we've asked Sarah and Danae, our discussants, to talk about what this, uh, to their responses to this toolbox and how we could deploy this in the United States and other markets to accelerate this agenda. And to wrap up, we'll have Uli and Ilmi uh, from, Uli is from the Sustainable Finance Programme at SOAS and Ilmi from the Sustainable Finance Programme at ClimateWorks, who've been instrumental in, in sponsoring this whole network, which we call the Inspire Network, an international network of academics and practitioners that have been working to develop the research and analysis to underpin this agenda. So a full program, we hope you uh, will stay with us for the hour and a half. We are recording this. Um, so if you miss any parts, you can uh, uh, look back in. So without further ado, Bob, I'm going to turn to you and ask you to help um, set the table for the discussion. Of course, Bob, um, the work you did for the Market Risk Committee with CFTC, I think really did help get this agenda on to the uh, minds of regulators here. I always said when you released your report, if we could implement the recommendations, I think the US would go from laggard to leader almost overnight. Uh, so Bob, do tell us uh, about your work on the report and, and your expectations for the future. Sure, thank you, Claire, uh, for first of all, uh, setting up this, uh, this webinar and, uh, and thanks to Nick and Simon and Ulri for uh, uh, you know, putting together this toolbox. Uh, to, I, let me start by sort of uh, framing the uh, perspective of the report that the CFTC subcommittee wrote versus this report. This report uh, focuses on central banks and focuses on the tools that central banks have to address climate risk. And in particular, uh, what might be kind of uh, at the front uh, of the agenda while we are uh, dealing with COVID. Uh, our report, the CFTC subcommittee was much broader. It focused on risk management of the US financial system and was not focused particularly on any institution, but rather what are the roles of all of the financial regulators and also all the participants in the US financial system. And I would say also the, uh, the toolbox represents uh, primarily a, a global 
perspective and uh, and in particular, what are different central banks doing and what could they be doing? Uh, our, our perspective was clearly US focused and, uh, and, and it reflected a broad range of uh, views from financial market participants, ranging from academics and uh, those in the not-for-profit not space, think tanks, especially those focused on environmental issues such as EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, the, the World Resources Institute, and the Nature Conservancy, and, and I, I'm on the board of the World Wildlife Fund, so we, we were all represented. Uh, but in addition, we had investors, asset owners, uh, we had uh, many corporations uh, representing uh, not only uh, banks, insurance companies, sort of the obvious choices. We had an exchange. We had a data company, S&P Global, number of ag companies, uh, and a number of oil companies. So we had ConocoPhillips and BP. So very wide range. I would say it was, first of all, amazing in the context of the U.S. political system that this uh, report was written. I give a lot of credit to the CFTC Commissioner, Russ Benham, who was the sponsor of the Market Risk Advisory Committee. And over a year ago, in a meeting of that committee, they brought in a number of experts on uh, financial system and climate risk and managing climate risk within the financial system and decided that they needed to take a, a closer look because other uh, you know, regulators who you might expect would be ahead of the curve, such as the Fed and the SEC and the FSOC, the uh, US Financial Oversight uh, Stability Board uh, Council, um, would, have, would have been uh, looking at this, but the commissioner and his market risk advisory committee thought there's really not a lot going on, so let's take a look. And uh, when the commissioner came to me over a year ago and said, Bob, would you be willing to chair this subcommittee? Uh, I remember <laughs> I was just amazed that it was happening. And, and I mentioned to the commissioner that, you know, my focus has been on pricing carbon, not on financial regulation. And he said, look, this committee has a very broad mandate. We want to understand what we need to do to manage climate risk in the U.S. financial system. And if pricing carbon is one of those issues, you know, feel free to uh, approach it that way. It, it, you know, it's not just what the CFTC can do. We want a roadmap, a high level roadmap for the entire financial system. So I was honored to take on this role. And together with the commissioner, I think we put together really a very amazing group of experts uh, from all of those different perspectives. Uh, and uh, we got started uh, uh, over a year ago, last year. And uh, I remember when we met for the first time, it was very interesting to me. I had no idea what the different uh, points of contention might be amongst this group. I thought uh, it'll be interesting to see. We sat down uh, uh, around the table for the first time. The commissioner, first of all, gave us a very nice mandate. He said, look, I want you to take a high level view of risk management, cl climate risk management in the US financial system. I want you to come up with as many recommendations as you can. I want this to be a consensus report uh, and let's look for maybe 50 pages. So as we went around the table, I gave some opening remarks about risk management. One of the things I said was, you know, as an economist, as, as a risk management professional, it seems to me the fundamental issue here is we're not creating appropriate incentives to reduce emissions. We're not pricing the risk embedded in the externality of emissions. Does anyone disagree with that? And as we went around the table, no one disagreed. Everyone agreed we have to have appropriate incentives to reduce emissions. Everyone from the academics to the uh, representatives from the oil companies. So I thought, well, that's pretty good. And then as we ran on the table, uh, another committee member said, you know, I think the fundamental thing we need here is mandatory disclosure of climate risk. And we don't have that. We don't have adequate disclosure. And uh, so we asked, does anyone disagree with that? No disagreement. There was an amazing amount of uh, consensus right from the beginning. So we just pushed forward. We, we broke into work streams and, uh, and, and wrote a draft of the report. We sent it to all of the institutions represented. So the commissioner was very clear. He didn't want just the expertise of the individual members and their views. He wanted the expertise of all of the organizations represented. And that was an agreement that we had right from the beginning. So 
The draft went back to those organizations. We got back over a thousand uh, comments the first time we sent the draft around. We incorporated those comments. We sent a revised draft around and we said to every organization, let us know if there's any red lines that you wouldn't be comfortable with. We got another almost a thousand <laughs> uh comments back we uh we had an amazing group of editors by the way and we went through those comments one by one and incorporated uh all that we could uh there were a number of dimensions where there were disagreements uh, disclosure was one where we had to you know dig down uh deeply about what what makes sense in terms of disclosure and that raised some of the fundamental issues that are also raised in this toolbox so, uh, you know, you've got both micro prudential issues and you've got macro prudential issues. So individual corporations have very localized and, and very uh, idiosyncratic climate related risk. If they're on a coast, maybe they have sea level rise. If they're in California, uh, you know, maybe they have wildfire issues. Uh, if they're a steel company, they have one set of issues, a cement company, a different set of issues, an auto company, a different set of issues. Uh, oil and gas company, a different set of issues. And what we need from the perspective of macro prudential oversight is we have to understand what are the systemic climate risks. Many climate risks are insurable. They're local and they can be handled. Uh, but some of these risks become uh, systemic and we have to recognize that and we have to deal with that. And one of the things that we all agreed on is this fundamental problem that we're not pricing the risk. And as long as we're not pricing the risk, what we in the financial markets understand is that capital is gonna flow in the wrong direction as it has been historically. And there's nothing that the asset owners or investors or financial regulators can do to steer that flow of capital in the right direction as long as the incentives go in the wrong direction. And, and so that's why at the end of the day, our subcommittee came up with 53 recommendations, the first of which, and the most important and most urgent, we all agreed on that, is that we have to have appropriate incentives to, to uh, reduce emissions. Now, in Europe, they do have appropriate incentives. They have strong incentives to reduce emissions, both through the trading system and also through fossil fuel taxes. And we do have some incentives in the US to reduce emissions through, through gasoline taxes primarily, we also have some subsidies to fossil to uh, uh, to uh, renewable energy. We also have some subsidies uh, to fossil fuels as well. So when you add them up, the incentives just aren't there. They're not adequate, and uh, and so that's the most important thing. And when you've got those appropriate incentives, then you'll have the appropriate flow of capital into the net zero economy. But we don't have that yet, and so the financial system really has two fundamental functions with respect to climate change. One is understanding and managing the risk. And there, one of the critical issues is that those local risks don't necessarily aggregate up well. What we need from an aggregate uh, perspective is decision useful information so that investors and asset owners can understand the risks embedded in their portfolios. So when we make uh, recommendations to financial regulators in this report, we focus on, first of all, they should understand uh, better the climate related risks in, uh, in the financial system, in the economy. Uh, they should lead by example when they manage assets. So uh, if they're buying assets or selling assets or owning assets, they should understand the climate related risks in those assets. And they should make sure that the data that they need, the analytics and the aggregation to understand uh, systematic risks are available and not just to uh, financial regulators, but also to asset owners and investors. And the asset owners investors on our subcommittee were very clear about that. Again, I would underscore decision useful information. And, and, and we certainly recognized uh, that the data and the analytics uh, that is necessary is very is at a very early stage. We don't have that. We don't have adequate disclosure. We don't have adequate understanding of these risks, and that has to uh, has, has to change quickly. We also focused on the fact that, frankly, the European regulators. We tried to be very uh, nice about this, but if you look in our report, you'll see we talked about the NGFS 
over 50 times. And one of our recommendations was, of course, that the Fed should join the NDFS. It shouldn't just be an observer. It should be a member. It should be a leader. And, and we should follow our European <laughs> regulators as they make recommendations specifically with respect to scenario analysis and stress tests. Those are the kinds of exercises that are necessary in order to understand uh, at the macro scale uh, climate-related risk. And, and so we need to think about the transition risk and what that's going to look like and what kind of risks that poses to different sectors of the economy and different individual corporations. And we have to think about physical risks and what is that going to do? Uh, now, and I'll also focus finally on one other point, which is that when we came into this, I think there were a lot of folks who thought the issue is mandatory climate risk disclosure. We need mandatory disclosure. Well, as we dug into it a little bit, what we realized is that that's not really the focus. It, there's already uh, a requirement for mandatory disclosure of material risks. And the real issue with respect to climate is what are material risks? And what we said is we need more uh, leadership and direction and a public-private you know, uh, partnership here to determine what is material risk. It's not easy because it's not like the traditional financial risks that we're all very familiar with. First of all, we have a long history of the kinds of risks that financial markets face, uh, you know, credit crunches and, and market crashes and so on. And so we can create a distribution and we can look at how much capital a financial institution has and is it prepared for the kinds of events that we've seen uh, and the probabilities of those events and so on. So those are how we usually think about risks in the financial system. We have a whole vocabulary in terms of value at risk and, and we understand the scenarios and the stress tests. With respect to climate, the problem is twofold, uh, two basic problems. One is we don't have a history, a relevant history. This is an emerging risk. It's going to be very different 50 years from now than where we are today, although there's tremendous uncertainty about what that's going to be because we don't have the history. We're doing this experiment for the first time. And then, you know, the second difference is that it's over a much longer uh, time horizon. So we usually think in terms of financial risks, what could happen over a relatively short period of time? Often it's like a three month uh, period, or maybe it's a couple of years, but it's not 10 years or 50 years. And, and those are the uh, time horizons over which these physical impacts are going to take place. And so how do we fit that long horizon and that uncertainty about uh, the potential outcomes into traditional uh, financial scenario analysis and stress testing? And how do we get decision useful information? And if I can just you know, point at some of the other areas where financial regulators have to focus, we don't have, at least in the US, a good taxonomy for you know, describing uh, climate related, uh, uh, let's say funds or instruments. We talk about green bonds, it's not well defined. We talk about sustainable funds or ESG funds. What does that mean? Uh, so when financial regulators try and um, talk about these issues, we don't even have clear definitions. So we have to really improve our, uh, our definitions, our understanding, and again, What's really striking to me, and I'm very proud of this, is that we had unanimous agreement from all of these you know, diverse members of the financial system saying to the regulators, we need your help. We need your leadership. We need to define terms here. Uh, we need to work together. And uh, so one of the things that is not at all surprising to me, given this consensus, is that the financial system in the US is moving forward very rapidly along the directions uh, that, were, that we were suggesting. So the Fed has already you know, uh, asked to join the NGFS and in fact been accepted. So it is now a member of the NGFS. The New York State uh, Department of Financial Services has already sent letters to banks saying, you, know, you have to start uh, better understanding and disclosing your climate related uh, risks. And, uh, and I assume that the FSOC and the other uh, financial regulators, you know, there's been a change of administration here in the US. We now have Janet Yellen as uh, you know, the incoming treasury secretary. She'll be chairman of the FSOC. I have no doubt that the FSOC is going to take up 
these uh, emerging climate related risks. The Fed in its financial stability report this year already spent two pages talking about climate related risks. Uh, the Fed has had a number of conferences and has, uh, you know, written, you know, many Fed economists in the US have written on this. There is expertise within the Fed. So it's developing. And, and, and this is all going to accelerate dramatically uh, as the new administration comes in. So uh, we're, we're very much in alignment with the basic themes that came out of the toolbox. We understand the need for uh, research in this area, for more uh, public-private partnership for this area, developing the analytics and the data and the disclosure that will allow for meaningful decision uh, decisions to be made uh, by investors, by asset owners, and so on. But having said all that, the fundamental issue is, you know, we don't have the right incentives in this country. And we have to do that. That's the role of Congress. Uh, that's something that I'm very focused on. And when we get those appropriate incentives, uh, then these other issues are issues that will be there and have to be addressed. But the urgent issue is creating appropriate price on carbon. And I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much, Bob. That was a tour de force of the uh, of the uh, agenda and the uh, landscape in which we and, and the moment in which we find ourselves. And like you say, pivoting to the new year and a new administration and expectations that it will all accelerate. But I think you're right that climate is the how would you say the ultimate known unknown lurking in every portfolio and lying dormant somewhere in the system, right? And at some point. Um, you know, it, it will, uh, just like uh, the pandemic, right, these other um, uh, risks, you know, will come, will become evident. Um, and while, you know, uh, us as an NGO, like we're coming at it from a climate related point of view, I think when I talk to financial, like people from the financial system or financial regulations, they're coming at it from a risk management point of view, as you say, right? And this is a core cool mandate of these institutions is to manage this sort of uh, this risk. And so it's good to hear, I think, just from when you published your report. I mean, imagine when you, you said you first met a year ago. Um, so a year ago, like COVID, you know, I don't think it was in the news or maybe it was sort of news. No, no, it was before COVID. We had two meetings before COVID and then we went virtual. And so the, the context within that, so it'd be interesting to see um, what you think of the, the toolbox, but what, in terms of um, next year, like how do you expect, like where, there's so much to do, and as you said, so much learning, and it's good to see that we have these spaces where different entities can share their learning, like the Bank of England or the European Central Bank with the Fed, you know, what they have been like experimenting with, with their stress test and their scenarios. There's so much, you know, learning to be done. Um, how do you see, like, what are the benchmarks in which you see over the next, like, not just the next year, but the next four years? You know, um, where would you hope this administration, like, what, what are the key benchmarks that we know we're sort of on track? Because as you say, it's getting the data and then using the data to, you know, make different decisions, right? So what are you hoping to see in terms of benchmarks of success? Well, I, okay, I, I'd say there's two dimensions here that are critical. One is to create those incentives to reduce emissions. And we absolutely have to do that. We have to, you know, this is the risk is exploding right now, climate risk, the systemic risk. And the way I think about it is we're on a trajectory here where right now the temperature has risen about one degree C since historical levels. The trajectory is almost two degrees C. Certainly, if we were to immediately create those incentives globally to reduce emissions. And by the way, my view is that the rest of the world is waiting for the US, that the US right now is the impediment to appropriate pricing globally. You, you do have strong incentives in Europe. In Asia, you know, we see China ready to get started. India hasn't yet started, but uh, you know, there's a number of countries that have imposed incentives to reduce emissions, but they're not strong enough and they're waiting for leadership from the US. So we've got to get that done. So that's that's number one. I'm actually quite optimistic. You know, I'm the co-chair with Catherine Murdoch of the, something called the Climate Leadership Council, which is the sponsor of the leading bipartisan uh, climate pricing plan in the United States. It's a bipartisan approach, and uh, I think it's very likely that we will get this uh, passed uh, next year in Congress. Now, 
not too many people are as optimistic as I am. But we, uh, we're moving in that direction. It, it remains to be seen uh, whether we'll get bipartisanship in the US. I actually think the pendulum swung way too far in this country and that we will see the pendulum swinging back toward bipartisanship. Uh, President-elect Biden is very much a bipartisan leader. I think he has a good relationship with uh, Mitch McConnell uh, in the Senate and, and the Senate Republicans here are key. And uh, I will just tell you that when you talk to Senate Republicans, most of them actually understand the reality of climate change. They understand uh, that it's caused by, you know, humans, by not pricing emissions. And they understand that what we need to do is to create those incentives. It's just a matter of finding the political opportunity. And I actually happen to think that that's coming. Uh, as an investor, I think that means that you want to place your bets. And you know what makes me so optimistic about this is that so many uh, uh, investors, uh, asset owners, corporations are all announcing that they want to be aligned with a net zero by 2050 economy or sooner. And, you know, to me, that's a very strong statement because net zero is a rapid transition. It's not going to happen without pricing. And so everyone's basically saying, we know this is where we're going. You see it in the valuations of securities. Uh, the valuations of the uh, oil companies have dropped by roughly half in the last seven years. The, uh, the valuations of other companies have roughly doubled. So what does that tell you? It tells you that this transition is well in progress and that it's already affected the valuations of securities dramatically. Uh, so I don't think it's something that's going to happen. It's already happened because financial markets are forward looking. And so, yeah, it may accelerate. I think it will accelerate and it'll have impacts across all the different sectors of the economy. And uh, so, you know, that's where we're going. The signposts will be when we start to take those pledges, which is all they are really right now is pledges and start making them into metrics. And, uh, and start measuring those metrics and disclosing those so that asset owners can engage with corporations. You know, uh, some oil companies have already made these, uh, you know, business plans public. They're moving from, you know, producing energy through uh, oil and to producing energy through renewable uh, approaches. And more generally throughout the economy, we should expect uh, corporations to uh, provide uh, business plans and metrics about uh, climate uh, so that we know that they are on target toward this rapid transition. So there's a lot to look for. A lot of that should be disclosed and, uh, and, uh, and we see that happening very quickly. So pricing and disclosure of uh, the metrics that will uh, allow investors, asset owners, and all of us to recognize that yes, indeed we are on the road toward a rapid transition. One of the chapters in the CFTC report was exactly about this. How do we change the flow of capital in the right direction? And you know, beyond just pricing risk, there's all these other things that financial regulators can be doing, a lot of which are in this toolbox. So uh, we're very much aligned in terms of the way we're thinking about this. I love, uh, I love your optimism, uh, particularly on the bipartisanship. Uh, I think it's a very good, uh, very good note to sort of end the year on. Although I have to say, um, and you know, I'm not even going to go down the pricing because uh, that's a whole other. That can be our next uh, webinar. I will say, you know, I've been party to some of the conversations with the Europeans, and um, you know, people, you know, uh, say the progressive sort of side in the US that may or may not be influential of the next administration around the issues of pricing, as you said, classification and taxonomy. The Europeans obviously are going to sort of um, increase their carbon price with their emission trading. They're going to put definitions around green bonds. Obviously, they have the platform around the taxonomy. And so some live discussion there around sort of what's in, what's not, um, and how sort of we get that joint approach or a coordinated approach. But like, where is the optimism? And, and, and I'll turn in a moment to, I think, Nick and Simon, as we move to how we converge these agendas, COVID recovery with climate risk. But before we do, Bob, where is your optimism come, coming from with this bipartisanship? Because we saw, as soon as the Fed made noises about joining NGFS, there was a letter from the Republicans saying, do not, do not take account of these risks. 
Um, and so while we've been hoping for a long time to see, I think, bipartisanship, particularly on this issue, right? Um, where is your optimism come from? Well, uh, yeah, in this country, we've been moving away from bipartisanship for so long that I think a lot of people are very uh, upset, depressed, and uh, and uh, don't expect it to to swing back. And and it may not. But uh, my perspective on this is that it has swung way too far. No rational person uh, is unaware of the reality of climate change anymore. Uh, no rational person is unaware of the risk uh, that's coming from climate change. And so, yes, there's a lot of people who are ignoring it, a lot of people who have become polarized uh, by, the, uh, by the politics. And the politics just went, you know, crazy. This, you know, we haven't had a, a really, uh, you know, bipartisanship on, on uh, many issues for a long time, including climate. But the way I view it is what's important in politics is money. And uh, historically, you had a lot of money from an entrenched industry that was uh, not only opposing climate action, but actually funding disinformation and creating the fog that prevented appropriate action. That money has dried up. Many people don't recognize it. But the truth of the matter is that the fossil fuel companies years ago stopped funding uh, disinformation. And appropriately so, because I think there's tremendous liability for you know, a funded disinformation campaign by an industry that knows better. And uh, you know, the, the leading think tanks on the, the side of disinformation, uh, they're going bankrupt because they don't have the funding they used to have. And at the same time, you have a tremendous increase in the amount of philanthropic money uh, in this uh, dimension, you've got, you know, folks like Bloomberg and Bezos who are giving hundreds of millions of dollars now to uh, the effort to uh, appropriately price climate and uh, and deal with this uh, situation. So things have changed dramatically. Uh, it, it seems like uh, the Republicans in this country are the only ones who haven't gotten the memo, but the reality is they've all gotten the memo and they're just waiting for an appropriate opportunity to change their tune, which is changing, by the way. The, the, even the talking points from the Republicans now and from interest groups like the American Petroleum Institute and the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers. These were all the lobbyists who were opposing climate action before. It's all changing. It's changing rapidly. And thank God it's changing because, you know, the truth is it's way too late. We should have done this 20, 30 years ago and we wouldn't have this existential threat. The liability yeah. that we have left I could go on and on, but let yeah, me no, stop no, taking the time and turn it over to the other panelists. I do, and we'll, we'll, we'll turn now to uh, Nick and Simon, but I do think you're right. The writing is sort of on the wall, but I always sort of check myself because I've been saying that for a while. But I do feel the last few months with all the net zero pledges, you know, um, not just UK and Europe, which sometimes I think the Americans discount, but Japan, South Korea, China coming China. out in Canberra saying net zero by 2060 and you know and obviously we hope to see near-term more concrete targets to you know to show that you know we're all serious about restructuring our economies but uh, it has felt the last few years and somewhat the private sector have been ahead of the, the politics and so it's about time that the politics I think catches up and hopefully with the U.S. re-engaging there'll be a chance to sort of um uh, to, for them to be out in front, because when you think Mark Carney's speech, I think was 2013, about the tragedy of the horizon, um, and then the FSB and the task force, what, what was that, 2015, 2016, so we've had a few years where, um, thank goodness the Europeans and many in Asia have sort of carried, carried on, but we're looking forward to getting the US back in action. So Bob, thank you very much for that overview. Um, and um, if there are any questions, you know, please do put them in the chat, in the chat room. But now I'm going to turn to Nick and to Simon, because as you said, when you first met Bob, COVID wasn't a thing. Um, and yet this year it has, it was the thing, right? It is the context in which we now all operate, including many of these institutions. And I was struck during the year when the Bank of International Settlements, you know, put out, you know, reissued their Green Swan report to sort of draw the parallels between COVID-19 and climate change, you know, um, 
as sort of like you know, um, the risks were small but had huge impacts and how they have extreme negative externalities. Um, and I think it's imperative now to start looking at how with these institutions and policymakers within central banks and supervisory bodies, how they're dealing with one set of risks and recovering from COVID. And the risk is that then uh, climate risk is seen as a distraction and once again gets pushed back. How we try and merge these agendas. Um, and to that end, uh, we're really glad to have Nick and Simon who did lots of work on this and created their toolbox. So Nick, I'm gonna pass the mic to you and I think you're gonna you know, give us an overview. Then we're gonna have Sarah and Danae uh, give their responses and then open it up for questions. So do put your questions in the chat room. We'll be looking at that and we'll be pulling those in when we open the floor up. So Bob, thank you very much for your um, comments and thank you for all the work you've done. Hats off, kudos that you managed to get consensus with your 53 recommendations. And we look forward to some, some of them being implemented very soon. So Nick, Thanks, over Claire. to you. Well, thanks so much, Claire. And obviously, uh, one of the recommendations has already been implemented with the uh, Federal Reserve joining the NGFS. So congratulations, Bob. And always a, a pleasure to be uh, in, in meetings such as this with a leader such as yourself. And thanks for all the, the great work you've been doing on climate risk over the years. Um, and I think, as, as many have commentated, the, the, the Federal Reserve joining the network for greening financial system is really sort of the end of the beginning for the discussion about the role of central banks and supervisors in how we confront uh, the systemic uh, risk of uh, climate change. So my name is Nick Robbins. I'm a professor in practice at the uh, LSE in London um, and co-chair of Inspire. And the paper we're about to present um, uh, was co-written with my colleague uh, Simon Dickow and we'll share the presentation and also Ulrich Voltz um, who uh, will um, come later in this, this particular uh, session. So next slide please. So just a little bit about uh, Inspire. Um, this uh, this is an, an international network, quite new, um, 18 months old or so. Uh, the, the name stands for the International Network for Sustainable Finance Policy Insights Research and Exchange. It's the brainchild actually of uh, Ilmi Granhoff, who again will be speaking a little bit later. And Ilmi and I both sort of co-chair uh, this, uh, this network. It's been particularly established um, to uh, provide and to expand the availability of high quality academic and other forms of research, which can support the work of central banks and supervisors, particularly uh, the NGFS. And we're delighted to be a global research stakeholder of, of, that, uh, of that network. Um, we have uh, three activities. We commission new gold standard research, uh, and we make that make that available. We convene researchers. We had had an event uh, earlier this year in September with about uh, just over 100 central bank uh, representatives uh, on on the line, listening to the research findings and brainstorming about the implications, and obviously communicating the results. Um, in terms of uh, the team, uh, we have a great uh, advisory committee uh, with Professor Yao um, from from China, from Beijing, Pierre Manon from uh, Switzerland, and Jacob Tomei from uh, from Europe. He's always he's in different parts of Europe, so it's difficult to track him down. Um, next slide, please. In terms of what we do, as I say, our key focus so far has been commissioning new research. We now have about 30 pieces of research. Some of it is now uh, coming out and is, is publicly available. So do check out our, our website. There's a lot of really interesting uh, work there. And also uh, Inspire has also been working directly uh, to support some of the uh, NGFS uh, core activities. So an occasional paper on environmental risk management led by Dr. Marjun, uh, and also some of the reference scenarios, which has also been supported by Bloomberg. In terms of the themes, the, the little uh, sun on the right-hand side gives you the seven themes we've been looking at. Some of these have been stuck, the sort of themes are very sort of central to this agenda. So microprudential issues, macroprudential, how we understand risk, risk differentials, monetary policy, that was the subject of our most recent call for proposals. Um, questions around sovereign bonds, obviously a major asset class which uh, central banks uh, hold. Questions actually about the effectiveness of green finance measures taken by central banks. Are they making any, any difference? And then the one in the middle, the one that we're going to be focusing on in this toolbox, the sustainable crisis response. So um, we have uh, been, been looking at this um, really since the, since the spring. And next slide, please. And this is the, the cover of the, the, the toolbox. This is the actually the second edition. 
So clearly, as the crisis mounted in, in the first quarter, we, we started with our experience thinking about what happened in the global financial crisis, realizing that actually this was going to involve huge uh, both fiscal and also monetary and other forms of regulatory intervention. Um, and in our discussions, actually, with a number of central banks, we started saying, well, how could we really grapple with this? You're making uh, more and more commitments, more recognition of climate risk. But how do we uh, how can we see whether these two agendas, COVID response and climate risk, how can we see um, that these two issues can be connected, which I think we, we see as an important issue. And that's really where the, the, the germ of the idea of the toolbox came. Um, Simon tells me actually at the end of, of April, we moved pretty quickly. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, and uh, produced actually the first edition of the toolbox, really setting out the architecture, um, the, the, the reason why we think it's important to connect these two agendas, the crisis response and, and, and climate risk, and produced the first edition uh, back in June. And that was really uh, to test uh, the, the response and the take up. And we had a lot of really good feedback from regulators across, across the world. And then just last month, we've updated that, really looked a lot more in terms of actually what has happened. So uh, Simon will present to you some empirical analysis um, and then actually look forward in terms of what, what needs to happen, happen next. Thanks. So, I mean, just briefly, uh, sort of why, why we should be uh, looking at this uh, convergence of, of, of uh, agendas, clearly, monetary authorities, prudential authorities have, have uh, come to the fore again, once again, um, uh, in terms of, of the crisis, particularly in terms of providing uh, liquidity to the, mar to the market. I think uh, it has also shown, um, in a sense, uh, what a, a real stress uh, to the system means. Uh, we, we, we know that uh, in a sense, COVID, like climate change, is a, is a known known in terms of a risk. This was entirely predictable as a zoonotic disease. Um, uh, the COVID comes out of the degradation and disruption of, of nature, exacerbated by climate change. And I think that that recognition that this wasn't a uh, something out of the blue, but really was linked to the broader sustainability issue. And as we've seen uh, in markets and sectors around the world, the shock, particularly the shock of uh, economic lockdowns, has served actually to really bring forward uh, some of the transition risks, which were th seen, I think, to be somewhat hypothetical. And I think particularly the uh, likely peaking of the global oil market uh, last year is, is, is one of those, with leading oil majors now recognizing that that, that growth is, is unlikely to uh, continue. Next one, please. So, um, in a sense, so the, the agenda for central banks and supervisors, why make this connection? I think the rationale is, is fairly straightforward. First, to think about uh, balance sheet risk, particularly if they are uh, buying assets uh, from the market. Um, clearly, central banks are somewhat different from ordinary asset owners, but that's a consideration still to bear in mind. Secondly, obviously, this, the institutions they, they supervise and the signals in their crisis response they're sending to financial institutions, they don't want to build up risk uh, in those uh, organizations. Then clearly there's the systemic level and we don't want to uh, inadvertently actually accentuate uh, the risk that is already in the financial system through a crisis response. And then finally, um, increasing numbers of, of governance, governments, international financial organizations are making clear commitments to a green recovery from COVID, uh, commitments to, to net zero, commitments to the sustainable development goals. And clearly uh, in, in, in many uh, agencies, many jurisdictions, uh, there is an important role uh, for central banks and supervisors to actually provide, um, to be aligned and to provide support uh, for the, the, the fiscal authorities and their, their governments. So, Next one, please. So this is uh, my final slide, and then Simon will really get uh, uh, open up the toolbox and, and, and go into a little more detail. But essentially, what are, what are, what does this toolbox do? We we've gone across um, all the various uh, measures that uh, central banks and supervisors have and could use to respond to a major shock uh, like uh, COVID. And we've identified these and essentially from a sustainability blind point of view, a sort of conventional approach, and then suggested how these could be sustainability enhanced and how these measures could be uh, calibrated. Three main uh, areas, uh, monetary policy clearly, so collateral frameworks, what are called indirect monetary policy instruments, so how reserve requirements can be changed, 
what are called non-standard instruments, so asset purchase programs, obviously a major tool in the crisis, and then other direct monetary uh, policy instruments. Then there's prudential policies uh, and how these uh, have been changed would need to be climate aligned on the micro and macro side. And then there are a range of other policies uh, in terms of different uh, financing schemes, management of central bank portfolios, and then actually, as we are seeing, uh, actually uh, central banks introducing sustainable finance climate risk uh, policies themselves. And Simon, I'm going to hand over to you at this point. Yes, thank you, Nick. So, um, yeah, I will, I will briefly discuss what we found in practice and then outline um, our ideas for what the next steps um, could be. So yes, we investigated the, poli the policy response of uh, central banks and supervisors in, in, in 188 countries. And um, this investigation is based on the IMF's um, response to COVID-19 policy tracker. So we found that almost all the instruments that are included in the toolbox are currently used as crisis response measures by, by central banks and supervisors around the globe, but not in a sustainability enhanced way. So generally, we have seen that many central banks have moved very quickly to, um, to expand their collateral frameworks to include a broader variety and quality of assets. And then many central banks and supervisors have also eased counter cyclical um, capital buffers and, and supervisory standards. Um, yes, so this figure provides an overview of the relative use of all these different instruments in the nine uh, toolbox categories. So as you can see, almost all of them have been used, widely used. And uh, well, in category two, we have the dominant crisis response instrument, which is the uh, adjustment of indirect monetary policy instruments. This is of course expected in 48% uh, in of, the, of the economies. And then this is followed by a change of microprudential instruments in 40% in, in of the countries. Um, generally, this is then the easing of, of supervisory standards. Uh, but generally, this, this figure also illustrates the, the broad variety of instruments that central banks around the globe have used to respond to the crisis. And what I will discuss next and what is important to note here is category nine on supporting sustainable finance. So these are not crisis, the, these measures that we have here are not crisis response related, but are independent initiatives that have been launched during the, the time that we have looked at. Um, yes, so, so turning to the sustainability dimension, we have found that only one central bank has explicitly um, calibrated a crisis response instrument in what we would call a sustainability enhanced way. However, in parallel to this, um, as, as, as shown in the figure, central banks and supervisors in many countries have taken steps to, to address sustainable finance or to, yeah, to implement related policies to address risks. Um, with regard to, to regional trends, central banks and supervisors in Europe and East Asia have been most active. And then um, the parallel sustainability action has also been mostly implemented or taken by, by central banks and supervisors in high income countries. Um, yes, with regard to, to uh, priority area, areas for integrating sustainability factors. So we like to think that the toolbox uh, provides a starting point for achieving the integration of A, all these sustainable finance policies that we have seen in the last nine months, and B, the crisis response frameworks. And we, yeah, we would like to highlight these four priority areas here as, as a potential starting point. So first, amending collateral frameworks to account for climate change related and other environmental risks. An important example here, an important, um, yeah, an important example here is the, is the ECB's announcement a few weeks ago um, that it uh, is considering um, to accept assets linked to sustainability performance targets as collateral. And this will also have implications most likely for its asset purchase programs. And then second, removing the carbon bias within corporate asset purchase programs and align refinancing operations with the Paris, uh, with, with the Paris Agreement goals. So some corporate asset purchase programs by central banks or that the central banks have now been uh, have now implemented in response to the crisis have been shown uh, to have again a carbon bias. This is especially true for the Bank of England and the ECB, where this research has already been done. 
So this, yeah, this would be important. Third, adjusting prudential measures to minimize climate risks and strengthen disclosure and stress testing requirements. Um, yeah, strengthening disclosure and classifications. Bob um, mentioned the, the importance of a taxonomy here. Um, is is important to enable, for example, something like risk base uh, a risk based green supporting or brown penalizing factor, and um, something like the CFTC report provides a very important um, well, framework or basis to discuss these risks and then to discuss uh, prudential action. Um, fourth and lastly, adopting sustainable and responsible investment principles for portfolio management, including policy portfolios of central banks. So today you might have seen today the, the Swiss National Bank has announced that it will exclude um, companies that are primarily active in mining coal from its portfolio. And the NGFS has also released a report two days ago um, on, on the implementation of sustainable and responsible investment practices in central bank portfolio management. So this is an important area and there's there, yeah, a lot is going on there. So this is definitely, this is our fourth um, priority. Um, in terms in terms of next steps and underlying rationale. So yes, it would be important that sustainability considerations are incorporated in all these easing and credit expansion policies that we have seen and that we still see. Um, yeah, the reason is to avoid a significant expansion of lending to economic sectors that are not aligned with not aligned with with transition plans. Um, yeah, well, the main argument is that otherwise this could be a significant investment in, in essentially stranded assets. Um, then the widespread and undifferentiated counter-cyclical release of regulation and supervisory expectations in face of these, of, of, of these transition and also physical risks is very problematic. And we would argue that if prudential, um, if prudential measures are released, assets and related exposure to sectors bearing the highest transition risks should be excluded from this. Um, yes, then the NGFS has made significant um, progress and we would argue that the implementation of all these proposed and discussed measures should be brought forward and applied to all crisis response measures. And then finally, further dialogue is of course needed and analysis to explore these, these well-established concepts such as the, the market neutrality principle because yeah it, it's important to discuss these and to also update this narrative in light of of market failures such as climate change and then also biodiversity loss uh, yes this is my last slide so the next phase for research we will we will therefore significantly expand this work next year and the uh, well a, a potential tool, toolbox 3.0 will then outline um, all the technical implementation details and, impl and, and implications for different regions and central banks. And we will focus on the four highlighted priority areas uh, on collateral frameworks, the Euro system collateral framework. There, there's already work going on within the Inspire network, but we also want to look at other national collateral frameworks. Then on asset purchase programs, there's work already being done on the EU and the UK. We want to expand this to also look at the, at the Federal Reserve's um, QE and, and the Bank of Japan's program. Then with regard to sustainable targeted and differentiated refinancing operations, um, one important starting point would be to look at the ECB's TLTRO. There, there's, there's some research now on this and it's an important discussion to have as it is an, uh, a central crisis response instrument. And then also targeted refinancing operations in Asia and emerging markets. Uh, Central Bank of uh, People's Bank of China is implementing something in this in this area, and then last but not least, the counter cyclical release of prudential regulation and super uh, and supervision. So, for example, um, a transition risk based differentiation of capital requirements should be should be explored and discussed in this context. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Yes, if you have if you have any questions, please please let us know. Wow, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot there. And, and these are some of the tools in the first toolbox uh, we were proposing. Um, and so there, are, because of COVID, you're saying it has opened the door to using these tools sooner than would otherwise have been the case. I have, I have a number of questions about that, but I'm gonna wait until the discussion and I'm gonna pass immediately to our first respondent, Sarah. Sarah, I think you know you could introduce yourself and uh, wh where you are now. But 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 um, based on your experience, I think working at the Fed in Atlanta, like what's your view 
of this toolbox and the likelihood we could Im implement some of these recommendations going forward. Yes, well, thank you so much, Claire. And thanks for all this great work of giving central banks the tools. A lot of people want to be doing this, but sometimes they need this, this help, this research to, to guide them there. Uh, yeah, to introduce myself, I work at NRDC, a large environmental organization, Natural Resources Defense Council. And I've been there for six years, but long ago, I worked for the Federal Reserve Bank for seven years, five years focused on monetary policy and two years um, doing economic education, teaching people about the Fed and economics. So I get kind of excited about this stuff. Uh, while that was years ago, I've recently been talking to people at the various banks and attending different events. Like they said, there's been a lot of them recently, and there's significant enthusiasm for integrating climate risk into its work. And now this guidance from the Fed leadership with the NGFS membership, I mean, you guys couldn't have timed this event better two days later. Um, I would say uh, that also really helps push people to consider how this is part of its mandate. I'll say this is less to do, I think, with the Biden administration. It's more about a move they've been slowly working towards anyway for the past year plus. But I will admit that uh, it doesn't hurt to have a president that will agree it fits in the Fed's mandate, especially as he um, hopefully will be able to appoint a climate-focused new governor to the currently open spot at the board. So I just like to point that out there that this is something they had been moving towards before the um, before the change in administration, just because that matters in part for our framing, which I'll talk a little later. In fact, the three things I think are kind of interesting to talk about today from my perspective are that the Fed is different than other central banks, the need to focus on a framework that uh, Simon was just mentioning for the next crisis, and how to frame our efforts to make them the most successful at the Fed. And I'll give a few ex specific examples on ways to move the toolbox. Um, specifically at the Fed. So main thing to start off with is, it's not the biggest difference, but it's something that will come up a lot in this specific work, is the Fed is different because they don't really usually buy corporate bonds. In fact, this is the first time they have ever directly bought corporate bonds, ever. <laughs> and the ECB does this regularly as part of their normal operations. So for example, they haven't been worried about market neutrality. That's not been something they've ever need to consider. So it's a different framework. Treasuries are their main avenue for monetary policy in normal times. These obviously haven't been normal times. But also after the peak of the last crisis, their main non-traditional action for monetary policy beyond the treasury was quantitative easing or helicopter money as some people call it. It was focused on mortgage backed securities. They weren't trying to be market neutral at all. They were trying to support the sector that was the center of the crisis. So corporate debt purchases and the idea of new market neutrality are all new, very new for this crisis. Now we know that the Fed, after this huge interventions they did to avert a global um, disaster with it uh, quickly, that corporate debt purchases are a possibility. So I totally agree with Nick that for 3.0, helping them to be prepared with the right framework if corporate bond buying comes back is really important. And I'll talk more in a second about that. Ne next, it's a, a unique structure with 12 12 different district banks and 24 branches. Each one has its own board of directors and they're all bankers and business leaders in their areas. They collect data for monetary policy, especially at crisis times like this or other points of inflection where the government data lags. Also, these directors um, and staff can disseminate data outward and information like on climate risk. Um, next, many of the COVID emergency programs from the Fed require credit um, congressionally provided funds to make take some of the risk and require treasury sign off like corporate bond purchases. I bring this up because, for example, for tool number seven, further financing schemes and other initiative, it's possibly easier to attach conditions at the congressional or treasury level. These conditions could be written into the equivalent of the CARES Act that provided funded last time or through the treasury they're less likely to come from the Fed. It doesn't want to pick winners and losers and thinks those sorts of decisions should be made by the federal government, Congress, and the president's administration. So to achieve some of the recommendations just for the emergency programs, Congress or Treasury might be the most effective route for implementing those requirements, like the recommendation for corporate financing facilities or loan guarantees to be subject to reduction of CO2 emissions or sustainability enhancing activities. So as I mentioned above, since the Fed has not been buying corporate bonds for their new normal operations, focusing our energy to help them push them to create a framework now for the next crisis or the second head of this crisis would be very effective. So absolutely agree with that point, Simon. Um, having been a part of the Fed during the last crisis, there really was a focus on stopping the entire financial system from collapsing. With that focus, the mission and the time was short, even shorter with this crisis, it's really hard to uh, do something in real time. Do I think that climate considerations should not be included? No, but I think 
that corporate bond buying is not something the Fed's normally doing. So it needs to, during times like now, not in peak crisis, to create a framework to advance number three for non-standard instruments. We as a network can help them with this research and recommendations. For example, um, buying already failing fossil fuel assets is too risky for the Fed to purchase with taxpayer funds because the credit risk is likely higher than is captured in their current credit score or other risks, as Bob was talking about. This fits into their framing and mission. They don't view it as their role to decide what industries get credit. Chairman Powell even said that very clearly yesterday in his press conference. I think, I'm not sure I got the exact wording right. We have shied away from credit allocation, picking which areas are credit worthy. I don't think we will change that. I believe him. They're not going to change that in the near term, no matter what the what governors join the board. It views its role very solidly as not picking winners and losers, but it is all for creating metrics and frameworks that help it best achieve its mandate. So let's do that in its framing. And that goes well to my last point, that framing for this matters, especially for emergency measures, at least in the near term, talking about the risks for certain purchases like fossil fuel assets as possible stranded assets. This argument is, is more likely to help it rather than purchasing oil and gas will destabilize, uh, destabilize the economy through climate change in the future. That can eventually be a consideration, but given its current research and framework, I don't believe it's the most successful argument at this time. So, the last point and others that have heard me talk about the Fed probably have heard this maybe too many times. Uh, what framing works for the Fed? Well, independence is extremely important. It is for all central banks, but the Fed really talks about that frequently. They don't actually put their, themselves as their mission to help support the federal government's policies. They are all about stability of the economy and maximizing um, growth, uh, maximum employment, stable growth, and stable prices. So, and that independence is probably even more important after the last four years of being pulled into the political spotlight by the, the current administration. That's the opposite of what the Fed wants. It wants to keep Congress happy, but so Congress will leave the Fed alone to do its job. It doesn't even wanna be perceived as taking actions based on politics. So that leads me to a point I like to make often. The more we frame this work in terms of its own mandates, the more successful we will be. As Bob talked about risk management, key parts of the Fed mandate include that. So we need to lead with data, research, and analysis as well. I, I said this is the Fed's love language is one uh, kind of way that people talk about. You have to speak to people in the way that they will hear, and that's how they will hear. Powell also talked about this yesterday when he asked about NGFS joining. We will be careful, thorough, transparent, and engage with the public. That is how the Fed and its staff act. Careful, looking at data analysis, working with their vast network across the country to make changes. It's not the easiest institution to move quickly for this reason. I view it as our jobs to help it move faster and deeper in these changes. I bring up these points to make, to take the recommendations from the paper and move us as a network of highly talented people to how we can help move the Fed. Some of the work we come from researchers on this call, perhaps creating investment frameworks based on transition risk estimates, like Clem Simon mentioned for Toolbox 3.0. Some can come from people working with congressional staff on the next equivalent of the CARES Act if it's needed. Some can come from work with our board, uh, with the board and district banks to help them see how central these actions are to the Fed's mandates. Some can be from within the Fed, some in ways that are not seen as direct to crisis interventions to begin with, like microprudential supervision. By having banks include climate risk, including transition risk at the loan level in their internal risk rating code, that would help move them towards recommendation number one, collateral frameworks. The main place the Fed accepts collateral is for its discount window, an especially important tool of crises um, as it is a place where banks can access capital. And it's usually intended to be for when things aren't going very well. The loans accepted most readily have this one to three internal risk rating code. If transition risk or other climate risk is included in that rating and pushes them to six or seven, they wouldn't be eligible as collateral. So focusing on including climate risk in the supervision of banks at that loan level can make a difference for the next financial crisis. I'll leave us on that specific example, just to kind of guide us towards a discussion of the specific ways that we can help in, engage with the Fed. Um, and I look forward to the Q&A. That's, uh, that's brilliant, Sarah. It's always really good to talk to someone from inside the system, because all of these institutions, as we know, have their own culture, but also their own political economy. Um, I will say though, um, like you know you said the fed doesn't like to be perceived as taking action based on politics one could argue the fed is perceived to be taking inaction on this issue because of politics they have you know slow rolled the whole process you know being an observer but not a member 
And you know, it is it is interesting the independence. Um, and while their peers have been sort of more vocal uh, and more forthcoming in terms of the analysis and the research, the Fed has been sort of sitting on notable and then sitting on the sidelines. And it has felt like we've been waiting for a change of administration for them to get different. Um, signals or instructions or signs to, that it's okay to take on this agenda. So I, I understand they want to be perceived as independent, but it is, you know, I feel like it's been uh, uh, sort of pent up. And now because we have this change of administration, all of these things are falling, you know, so that's interesting. And then one other question, and then we'll, I think, come to Danae for a more global perspective. I have heard uh, many many civil society groups obviously criticize the Fed and other like ECB, BOE, et cetera, for their asset purchase, for the fossil weighting in the asset purchase programs. And then I've heard their defense in that, hold on, you know, this was a crisis. And the first thing is to stop the heart attack, you know, that immediate stabilization phase. Uh, you know, there are other issues to the fore, like preventing the, you know, the financial system grinding to a halt. So you know, uh, don't criticize us, you know, and that's in that immediate stabilization phase. And so the toolbox, and now, you know, we're talking sort of more stimulus and that counter cyclical financing, how do we green and get that in the right direction? Um, uh, monetary policy as well as fiscal policy. But I do think this, when we think about the structural reforms that we need, and we know we need, not just from the climate point of view, but also from, I think, you know, fair and balanced growth and sort of equity agenda. I think this is where we need to start looking at these institutions and how they make their decisions um, and where these frameworks, I think, can really go in. And I will say I've heard anecdotally from the Fed, even on this other crisis in the US, sort of uh, uh, race, the race relations and racial equity, the Fed is a very um, conservative institution, has also uh, shown sign being quite forward leaning on that and not just in terms of their own hires and employees but how they're using these asset purchase programs to tackle that crisis right to sort of and so th that shows sort of a willingness at least uh sort of indicating maybe it's due to the sort of the the the, the, the more senior staff or more diverse staff perhaps that it is shifting um so it'd be interesting if you've heard or seen anything along those lines. I'll start with the second one just because that's what's fresh on my mind. I'm not sure they've used it to frame their asset purchases, um, the racial equity, but it's definitely something they're leaning into and I'm really proud of them and I think it really is interesting and exciting because I think we also forget that some of the Fed's tools are communication and some of their not just monetary policy. There's a lot of different things yeah. that they do. And so I think in lots of ways, there's lots of places and I'm happy to really dive into them, but to be short, I'll just kind of talk about, you know, like community um, development is a piece of theirs under the Community Reinvestment Act and fair truth and lending. So there are a lot of spaces where they can more directly do that. And then it necessarily does need to integrate all of it and not saying it's excluded from monetary policy, but there are lots of places. Um, in terms of the administration, I definitely, it doesn't hurt but lots of things were already in process for a long time. They were trying to do them probably more discreetly because not only are they not trying to be political, but let's admit this administration wasn't the normal kind of administration. They really attacked the Fed and they really at some points tried to undermine their credibility just generally, nothing to do with climate change, et cetera. So I definitely will admit that there was a lot of you know eagerness to try and subtly start working on these things, but it's not like, the election happened and all of a sudden it was the first time they'd ever mentioned it. It was last January when they started talking about NGFS. It's, you know, and they had an event last November in San Francisco all about climate, didn't hide it. The, um, Governor Brainerd was there and gave an amazing speech about how this is part of the Fed's mandate. There were three climate events in November, you know, scheduled before the event was done. So yes, I don't disagree having an administration that's not gonna call you out, that's not gonna try and destroy you for saying something is going to be helpful. But I just think the more we frame it as a, a, as a Biden-based thing, I actually think we'll probably be less successful. I think the more- yeah. We kind of talk about it as a that is helpful and we want that to be supportive but this is something the fed has been working towards anyway i do think that that kind of fits with what i've been seeing 
definitely science-based um, all around. Okay, so, I, and I don't mean to put you on the spot to defend the Federal Reserve System, um, basically, um, but that was really helpful. I'm gonna turn to Danae now, who has been party to a number of these conversations with a view, you know, with other lens, with European and in Asia, and just to hear your response. You know, so you're from OMFIF. Um, you could introduce sort of the institution. Um, I've heard it being the think tank to the central banks. Um, but um, what your perspective on the toolbox, and in particular, my question is: We've been trying to integrate climate risk into routine operations of these institutions. Should we be using our energy just to maintain that focus uh, as opposed to try and broaden it into COVID recovery strategies and these asset purchase programs, which in due course, you know, will, will, will run its course, right? So is, does that help or hinder progress? It'd be interesting to hear your view on that. Danae. Thanks, Claire. And it's a real pleasure to be here and to be discussing the toolbox. I think it's an excellent contribution to the role of central banks in managing climate risks. It's also great timing that we're discussing this after the Fed has just joined the MGFS and great discussion on that so far. So congratulations to all involved in that. I think it's important um, to introduce, yeah, so first to introduce myself, I work for OMFEP, the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. We are a stakeholder member of the NGFS and have been working with them since the beginning. We work with a number of central banks very closely, and uh, we also in September launched the Sustainable Policy Institute that works specifically on sustainability related issues with central banks and other regulators, and we've um, published a number of research reports on that. So just to start, I think it's important to focus on the, the strategic rationale for central banks in getting involved in climate risk management. And I think the report does that very well. And Nick and Simon in their presentation had these four reasons about the kind of balance sheet risk and the financial sector and, and systemic risk and also the policy alignment. And I think it's, it's good to have that framework of these four areas, but you can also group them more broadly into kind of the three first, which are the risk areas and then the, the policy alignment on it. And I think it's helpful to think in that dimension when you discuss things such as central bank independence that Sarah was, was raising just now or the issue around the politics of, of climate change. Um, but I think when you look at what central bankers have actually said about climate risk, and, and I'm glad Sarah raised just now this conference that the Fed put together last here in November, because in that speech that you referenced that Lael Brainerd made, she was also talking about how fighting climate change or incorporating climate risk is nothing really new conceptually for central banks. She likened it to, for example, in the past, we've had to deal with financial globalization or the revolution in information technology. And when you hear someone like Francois Villera de Gallo, the governor of the Bank de France, from 2018, I think he mentioned how uh, is the new frontier for central banks in the same way that in the 19th century was the financing of big infrastructure or in the last hundred years, it was the fighting of, of global financial crisis. So central bankers have always had to deal with these new frontiers. And I think the framing is very important in that and kind of focusing on that risk angle that it is about protecting the financial system from non-financial sources of risk in its own operations, but also making sure that the financial system is not a source of these kind of risks for the real economy is, is, a, is a good first way to see that. And I liked, I really liked what Bob said at the very beginning about how financial institutions are, the, are themselves realizing that and that investors are placing their bets, are having to, to deal with that even before the regulators set the signals. Because if you're a financial institution in the US and the Fed is not really acting on that, at least officially, I appreciate Sarah's point that a lot of work has been happening and a lot of processes have started. But if you're a financial institution in the US and you know that the Bank of England is working on this, that you know that the European Central Bank is working on this, the European Commission is preparing a taxonomy, you're going to start making some preparations. You're going to start uh, um, working on that because a lot of the financial institutions in the US operate on a global level as well. So I think there is a sense of inevitability to that happening and, and coming from financial institutions. So where, where you as a regulator as a kind of second move uh, player there, whereas in Europe it was the central bank that sent the, the signals first with the um, um, 
plans for climate stresses, regulation, setting up the NGFS, coming up with a taxonomy and kind of financial institutions coming after that. I think in the US, it perhaps is coming a little bit the other way around. And, and in my conversations with asset managers, with investors, with, with uh, asset owners, such as pension funds and sovereign funds, I mean, some of the pension funds have also had regulations directly to them about divesting from fossil fuels, for example, fossil fuels, for example, in, in, in New York or California. So we've already seen that coming from the um, investment sector, um, there is, they do worry when I've been speaking to them in the past year before the, the Fed uh, kind of became more serious about this, that uh, we are going to start developing our own measures, our own standards, if we don't have that direction from the regulators. And that's another risk that central banks and regulators have to face, that if they are too slow to act, it may be that the private sector becomes to the starts doing its own thing. Uh, and I think the, the climate uh, toolbox that we're discussing is very important in creating that framework. I think the second rationale, which is the policy alignment, is also very important because uh, as a public institution, and the Fed very much has that, that focus, as Sarah was saying, about communication, about connecting with the public, you must be seen to be aligned with, with the political decisions of the um, elected government. And it doesn't matter if the current administration um, does not support certain initiatives when you know that governments have committed to, um, to agreements such as the Paris Agreement, for example, even if they've not acted on them, that can be taken as a signal for the supervisor and the regulator to say, we know that politics are heading in that direction. Yes, they've not implemented a carbon uh, tax at the moment, but to get to the goals of Paris, they will have to. And so we have to prepare ourselves and the financial institutions that we supervise and that are in the financial system that we look after for that. Uh, now on your question about uh, COVID and the timing and the crisis, I think um, what Nick was saying as well about the, the timing of this crisis and how COVID has really uh, increased the awareness of the, um, of the vulnerability of the financial system to non-financial sources of risk. You presented it as a, a, it is a zoonotic disease. It does create this, um, this um, alert among financial institutions that our, that our system is very fragile and very vulnerable to kinds of shocks and, and incidents that we cannot really put into or have not put into models before. Uh, and so I think in that sense, it is a good timing to think about how do we use this crisis not to go back to the system that we had before, but to create a more sustainable economic system because that is the key lesson from COVID. So I do think it is important to focus the crisis response measures on that. Um, I don't think it should be a trade-off or it should be a, a kind of dilemma between do we use the normal instruments because some of the, the crisis instruments will run out after that. I mean, I appreciate, for example, in the case of the ECB, the PEPP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program is more temporary. Uh, but I don't think that means that, for example, when thinking about the TLTROs, we cannot think about greening those, even though they are unconventional or emergency measures. We've seen through the previous crisis that a lot of these temporary and unconventional measures have actually become quite conventional and permanent. So um, I think we should focus on what are the tools that central banks have? How can they use them? I think the framework that we have in the report that really breaks it down into the functions of central banks, because it's not just monetary policy, it's supervision, it's reserves management, it's their own portfolios, their monetary portfolios, but also their pension uh, um, assets, their, their, their foreign reserves assets. And it's about becoming sustainable in all those dimensions. Um, so I think the answer would be that, that in both they should, they should focus on that, both for the risk rationale and for the aligning policy with what their governments have already committed to in terms of Paris, in terms of the SDGs and so on. I'll stop here and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Danae, that was um, that was a really good sort of uh, response based on your overview. Um, I, I think there is a lot to be said about the coherence, you know, getting the alignment, you know, uh, between these programs, even if it's after the fact, like it's an emergency response. So I do like the toolbox, how it sort of is trying to go from where we are uh, and move us forward in a more coherent sort of frame. Uh, we did have a question, I think, um, please do, you know, if you've got any questions, I know some of these discussions can be sometimes quite technical. And for non-financial audiences, uh, sometimes intimidating, but please don't feel that way. If you have a question or you're curious, pop it in. We did have a question from uh, Chidi uh, about to each of the panelists to name one tangible central bank policy that enforces the Article 2.1C of the Paris Agreement 
which is to align global financial flows with the temperature increase. And Patrick Flynn saying, it's great to see the toolbox and the efforts that have been made to implement climate change policies, but how do we incentivize these organizations to speed up the process? What is the expected time frame of implementation? I think it's a good, a good uh, question. Um, should we do a round? Uh, I'll put that one first to sort of like Nick and Simon. Um, and then we can see if there's any more questions, Sarah and Danae, before we ask Ilmi and Uli, just to wrap up and say more about the network and where we go from here. Nick, do you have a response to those yeah, questions? So, um, this is obviously a very well-informed audience to get down to Article 21C of the Paris Agreement, my favourite article, making financial flows consistent with low greenhouse gas and climate resilient development. So one of the things is, and I think is interesting is that um, I think that direct linkage by central banks to the Paris Agreement ha has not been made, particularly in the context of the net zero co commitments. And I think that's one of a piece of uh, research actually that uh, uh, Simon and Uli and I are doing is actually saying in the context of increasing number of banks, financial institutions, uh, pension funds, asset managers and so on, uh, themselves setting uh, net zero goals, increasing number of governments setting net zero goals, that actually what is the role, what is the right response uh, of central banks to net zero and therefore to Article 21C? In, in, again, from the, the fundamental risk point of view, that a 1.5 degree world, a net zero world, is going to be much more a, a world in which they can deliver their core stability uh, mandates. So that's a piece of research. So watch this space early next year. That will be coming out. Simon, any thoughts on that? Like, what's the tangible central bank policy that enforces that? Or more on the time frame of implementation for some of the, the tools that you've highlighted? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe just yeah, just two thoughts. Also picking up on what on what Sarah said. Um, I think framing is again everything here. So um, I think the toolbox provides an interesting framework because we see what central banks are able to do. So of course it's a general document, so it applies to all central banks. But looking at the response of the different central banks, and especially looking at, at targeted policies, for example, employment supporting policies, um, SME supporting policies, you get an idea of what central banks are able to do and which tools they have in their portfolio. So different national central banks. So I think this this provides an interesting starting point for for, for discussing implementation and then including climate change and climate risks. And then with regard to the Federal Reserve, I, I think focusing on risks is here is key because this is, this is the gateway drug for central banks. So if you can convince them that climate change risks are, are important or are, are affecting them and the financial system they are overseeing, then this is the way in. Discussing aligning asset purchase programs or collateral frameworks, well, collateral frameworks also the risk questions, but asset purchase programs or directed policies, I think that's something that comes much later. I think for the ECB, there were two or three years between acknowledging climate risks and talking about, about asset purchase programs. So yeah, maybe just in terms of timeline and, and, and framing. Sarah, any, any comments on that? Yeah, well, the first one's easy. Uh, tangible central bank policy from the Fed, not really any. They've been starting to do the research and things, which are like a great first step, but they don't really have like a tangible thing they're doing yet to uh, enforce Article 2.1c. What, um, what would be the first sign, you know, the first intervention, and then moving from just studying it to doing something? Exactly what Simon was saying to call it in their words, micro and macro prudential regulation. So there's the individual institution. So you can start working on that quite quickly. They can begin with the supervisory vote this year. I'm not saying it would be integrated immediately, but they could get going quite far as well as on the macro on the whole entire system, especially through FSOC. They're a part of that. There's a lot of different places that they can work on those. And I can get very specific um, in, an, in another follow on conversation, but micro and macro prudential, just like Simon said, risk. Yeah. Danae, any comments about the question? Then I'm going to hand over to Ilmi. Yes, thanks. Very quickly, I think just on the timing, I think it is inevitable that we are speeding up. Uh, if you look at the trajectory of the NGFS, started off with under 10 members now, uh, it's it's multiplied. And, and I think we are seeing that go in the right direction, not fast enough. I think uh, game changers would be things like the taxonomy, for example, that is creating standards, um, more data and better data. I think that's kind of where we're moving now. And that was also what Lael Brainard said in this 
um, comment on the financial stability report in November this year, uh, where she was saying that we need to move from the kind of having the attention on this risk to accurate, accurately quantifying them, assessing them and addressing them. And I think that is the shift that we're seeing now. That's the stage we're at. And that's how I would frame the timing. That's good. And uh, moving from the gateway drug, Simon, I like how you said that, to the uh, the love language, as Sarah called it, of these institutions. And to that, on that note, Ilmi, you're the co-chair of this network where you try to produce more of this love language, data analysis research. So do come in and tell us what you think of the toolbox and the path forward. Sure. Happy to. Uh, I'll try to be brief, but um, I'll take my job as tying a bow on some of the themes that have elevated here and connecting them a little bit. So to Bob's point, and then what inspired us next, to Bob's point, um, climate risk is unpriced in the economy. He is correct. It's uh, hard to deal with this if it's unpriced either directly through carbon pricing or through other types of regulation that, that um, price carbon indirectly. But the issue is that that doesn't free financial regulators from their responsibility to maintain financial stability. So is that unfair? Yes, it is unfair. If we had dealt with this problem in the early 90s, um, we probably would not have to talk about the role of supervision and financial regulation and climate change because it would not pose financial stability risk. But was the health crisis that caused that was created by COVID um, that turned into a financial crisis? Is it fair that it turned into a financial crisis? No. Was the, was the financial crisis created by a housing crisis in 2008 that should have been addressed by underlying, underlying housing policy? Um, was it fair that it became a financial crisis? No, but it did. And a climate is not too dissimilar from that. So um, at the end of the day, um, financial regulators are stuck taking the limitations of economic policy and managing them. And that's what, the situation that we're in now. So regulators have to price that risk in, in their own operations to ensure financial stability. And they've got a double problem because they have to price in both the lack of ambition in economic policy and the set of impacts that that has on the economy. They also now have to price in that we will have a very rapid and disorderly pathway to decarbonization. And that will have a knock on impact on the, on the financial sector and the economy. So, and they've got to manage both of those now. And there's no way around it other than to try to sort of pretend to ignore it for as long as possible, which is I not I think not the right path. So the basic rationale for the financial regulators, central bank supervisors and other financial regulators is, is maintaining financial stability. It is not about climate ambition in the first instance. It is about the fact that they are stuck with a bunch of risks uh, that they're supposed to manage that could have been managed through economic policy and now they have to address them. There is a deeper conversation that should happen to the you know, questioners' questions about the affirmative responsibility of these institutions to help promote the transition. And I think that conversation is actually beginning to happen and how that relates to the mandates of some of these institutions, depending on the institution. But at, at, at the first instance, we're just talking about them taking the problem. Now, the reality is, if you get firms in the financial sector to properly manage climate risk in their operations, it will cause capital to reallocate and it will lead to decarbonization. So it does have that effect, but it's important to understand the rationale why these institutions are acting. So the C C C CFTC lays out very clearly a set of tools in the US across the entire financial regulatory system, not just central banks and supervisors, as Pop said. Um, but, um, and, and what are the things that the government can do on day one? Well, because financial regulation is complex in the US, this needs to be elevated to the treasury, which has the ability to oversee a lot of different financial regulatory bodies and including the research. Um, from the central bank and supervisory side, what are the day one actions that, that, that um, the Fed can take? I put it in three buckets, research, surveillance, and guidance. So the Fed all the time tells the market things like, how do you value oil reserves as collateral? <laughs> uh, how do you treat agri um, agricultural risks as a bank risk? 
providing guidance on that has a lot of climate implications if you take transition and physical risk seriously. So there's immediately things in those buckets and they lay the foundation for more active regulatory and supervisory measures. Why is the lens of recovery important? And this is my kind of concluding point to tie these two issues together. One is the unprecedented scale of these programs has an impact on climate change if we don't incorporate climate risk into those measures. So we really have to, or we will be compounding risk rather than ameliorating it. We'll be setting ourselves up for further financial instability. But two, it shows us the full set of tools that these institutions have. To Danae's point, um, many programs that are unorthodox become, become normalized through the process of these crises. So the question about what's in the toolkit changes through the lens of the recovery. And it should change as we try to think about the tools that these institutions have to manage climate risk. So the four key buckets that Nick and Simon laid out are collateral frameworks, asset purchase programs, sort of differential approaches to refinancing, and, and the pr when prudential rules are changed to manage a crisis. And all of those are areas where we have to use a sustainability and climate lens while these programs are still, even though they're temporary, they're still being um, run now. Um, so it's still timely to do that. So um, the recovery is both a lens through which to understand the problem and, and also just gives us a very different toolkit. So finally, what is Inspire doing about that? Two things. One, the Fed is joining. It's not the same as every other member joining. The Fed has 400 PhD economists that can work on this issue and the scale is enormous. And they should not just be joining, they should be leading. And that's not just at the NGFS, that's also at the FSB and then the G20, where we can elevate this and say, across the board, this is a financial stability issue, climate change. Um, and we need to figure out and inspire how to integrate the US research community and work with the Fed. And so that's something we have to figure out. And then on the recovery, we need to fill those buckets with more details about how to implement those four tools. And that is our next step. And Simon, Nick, and Uli and I have been talking about how to do that. So I'll leave wow. it to Okay, I, I, you tied it beautifully, Elmi, into a lovely, beautiful bow. Um, and I'm gonna ask Uli just to say a word about like our consortium. And we've had this conversation with respect to the US. If you could point listeners to, in the direction of where we've had the same or similar conversation about Europe and Asia, that I'd also be very grateful, Uli. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I'm aware that we're already after hours, but, but um, I'll try to be quick. So. Um, indeed, this has been uh, part of a uh, Inspire uh, research project and series on uh, sustainable crisis responses, and, and uh, we actually uh, set this up before COVID was on the agenda, so we had to adjust a little bit. But um, um, so we, we've had a had a lot of conversations and, and discussions uh, with central banks, regulators around the world, and, and um, uh, it, it's very clear that. You know, every country is different. Every uh, central bank, every regulator has very specific context in which they operate. So some of the, the points we, we've had in today's discussion, which are very specific to the US context, obviously don't apply elsewhere. But I, I think uh, clearly we are seeing uh, this very broad recognition that, that central banks and supervisors need to do something. But I would like to, to, to emphasize that I also do see that in many of these conversations, there is still a bit of a hesitation. Everyone's praising our toolbox and say, oh, this is, we, we've been, you know, this is what we, we've, we've been waiting for. And, and, you know, we need this guidance. And, and I think Inspire has been doing tremendous work in, you know, uh, commissioning a lot of great research uh, that, that partly is also very operational. Uh, but I, and, and certainly we will continue with the toolbox 3.0 to, to kind of, Put more meat on on the bone. I'm, I'm a vegetarian, but you know, kind of to use that. Um, but to 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 uh, you know provide further guidance. But I do also think that we have come a really long way now. Um, a couple of years back, uh, you know, we were still trying to convince central bank supervisors, hey, this is a topic you have to work on. Everyone has accepted that basically now. So although we with the NGFS now having the US on board. Um, we're really now in a, in, in, a, in a state where we need to get going. So there are a lot of very practical, uh, practical things that can be done already. Um, uh, Bob mentioned that uh, uh, in his speech, mandatory disclosure. Let's not discuss that anymore. Let's just do it now. 
um, uh, mandatory uh, stress testing and, and, and uh, environmental uh, uh, risk uh, analysis. Um, the the, the um, NGFS published uh, two months ago um, uh, a study, uh, and, and uh, I, uh, with Marjun and Van Caldecott, co-edited one uh, big volume with uh, 36 case studies uh, of environmental risk analysis. We have really a lot of methodologies out there already that can be implemented now. Of course, there's a lot of uh, further work to be done, but we, really we can be, uh, get going and central banks can get going. And I would like to, to, to highlight the sense of urgency because we, we obviously, uh, uh, the climate crisis is really uh, uh, giving us only a few years to change and the risks are, are also uh, uh, enormously high. So. Um, we need to uh, central bank supervisors to get going now. Uh, the, the toolbox is an invitation uh, to, to uh, you know, use some of these tools. Um, there are many researchers uh, in academia, think tanks, also central banks who really uh, are cracking to get going on these things to really make it all operational. And, and I think this is now the time to, to do that. I think you're right. I think so. 2021. Let's make it the uh, the year of action. You remind me when we had these conversations with many people in these institutions, these very conservative, not conservative, cautious institutions. Uh, the um, Albert Hirschman's book, Rhetoric of Reaction. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but just the same or similar arguments. You know, the futility, perversity, jeopardy. It's the same set of arguments, but. I think now we have enough data and COVID uh, is a lived experience we all share that shows that if we don't manage these risks and take these risks seriously, they do come and bite us in the proverbial. So on that note, um, this has been great. It's been an honor to be part of this network. I think we're just scratching the surface. And I do think now we um, see the US re-engage and uh, uh, I think hopefully we'll see a, a massive acceleration of the implementation of these tools and you know, with the uh, through various diplomatic processes and getting those signals and those positive feedback. So from the G's about the mandatory disclosure. And so a virtuous circle where we can get to where we can get a lot further, a lot faster. But for now, I'll close this out. Uh, this will be posted also on our websites alongside the other conversations if you're interested. And we will come back around again in the new year to see where we take the conversation um, next. Thank you all. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Bye. Thanks. Bye.